The Focus of Freedom, from the Freedom Tabernacle Baptist Church and Freedom Tabernacle Ministries in Atkins, Virginia. Home of Camp Freedom, a regional outreach to our youth. Freedom House, offering counseling, intervention, emergency shelter, and food distribution. And with our many missionary partners, reaching out around the world with the light and love of the gospel of Christ. And now, the focus of freedom. So upon the infallible, eternal, undeniable word of God I stand. Hello everyone, and as always, appreciate you watching. I really do. I've said this countless times through the many, many years here on the Focus of Freedom. Wouldn't be one bit of use me being here if you weren't there. So, sincerely, thanks for watching. We appreciate it. We really do. Well, God's blessing us here at Freedom. We're trying our best to get all the flooring finished up throughout the classroom so we can kick off this uh, outreach. We're planning to, uh, you know, we've reloaded, restored, revived, rekindled, renewed, and uh, we're ready to come out of the gate stronger than ever here at Freedom. So pray for us at Freedom Tabernacle Ministries, Freedom House, Camp Freedom, everything that we're doing. We just need your prayers. And for all of you that come by, uh, Camp Freedom and Freedom here on Freedom Ridge in Atkins, Virginia. We want you to know you're always welcome. And all of you who were here for camp meeting back in July, all you got to do is write P.O. Box 631 uh, in Atkins, 24311. You can copy it off of your screen. It's on, peri on there periodically throughout the entirety uh, of the Focus of Freedom. And just ask for the DVD or the CD or both uh, of the camp meeting. And you can have those, the browders, the greens, all the various preaching throughout the week. Uh, tremendous, tremendous preaching. Uh, God blessed. That's all I can say. He richly moved and blessed. And you can relive that camp meeting over and over again and uh, individual nights available on individual DVDs or you can get the entire package. All you got to do is write and request for them and, and you can get those and we would love for you to have them. Any other uh, episode of the Focus of Freedom that you would like, all you got to do is contact us but you can go to YouTube and just type in Focus of Freedom and every single week we're right there uh, on YouTube for the entirety uh, of the services, things that you would not see uh, on the Focus of Freedom. A lot of times you can see there on YouTube because it's edited here on Living Faith, but there on YouTube you can enjoy the entire service. And especially if you can get some little device, maybe fix it up your own creativity and fix it up for your elderly parent or your grandparent that might be in a nursing home or shut in at home. So many of our precious elderly folks uh, tell us that they're blessed through the ministry of the Focus of Freedom and we appreciate that and we really appreciate you children and grandchildren trying to help your grandma or your granddaddy be able to, and so many of them like the old time way uh, you know, of service. I, you, people tell me sometimes I'm a, a re relic of the past. I'm an old-time preacher. Well, I just simply say to that, if you'd known the old-time preachers that I grew up listening to, I don't know if this day's world could handle some of them or not. But I consider that a compliment. I really, truly do. And all of you who are getting up like me in some years, uh, just always wonderful to be able to minister to you. And everything else that we do here at, at Camp Freedom in the camps and different outreaches to kids, and, and especially now Freedom House is going to be transitioning into foster care and eventually, hopefully, Hopefully and prayerfully a children's home. Of course, we've got the state of Virginia to deal with with that, with the renewal of a licensure and all. I just mentioned that briefly because that's in the future, but uh, we'll be saying more about that in the, as the fall progresses and as wintertime comes upon us. We'll be saying more about that. But right now, let me give you an invitation. It's going to be September the 10th, Lord willing, homecoming at Freedom. We'll have plenty of stuff to eat physically and a whole lot of spiritual food, so 
everyone that was with us at the camp meeting, let's do it again. One day, uh, September the 10th, Sunday, try to be here. Now, we'll announce probably in a couple of weeks we'll probably have a special guest singer. Of course, we got plenty of singers and music here at Freedom too, and uh, we'd love to have you to come and spend the Sunday afternoon with us uh, here at Freedom for our homecoming 2017 as we celebrate our birthday here on our homecoming on September the 10th. That gives you Labor Day weekend free to travel, get the last little deals in for summer, and then as we begin the fall, we celebrate our homecoming September the 10th. So put that down on your calendar, and we'd love to have you here at Freedom. Now we're going to have prayer, then we're going into this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom. Heavenly Father, you know the need in all of our lives, and I pray that you'll give us ears to hear your word, that we as your people would be blessed, you would reach out with love and conviction to those who may be unsaved, and then whatever need someone may have, I pray, oh God, that you would encourage those that are struggling, maybe with wayward children or an elderly parent or some type of crises at their job, their finances, their physical health, emotional health, marriage, family, whatever the burden is, we cast that care upon you absolutely knowing that you care for us. So encourage all of our viewers in the faith, in hope, and in love. In Jesus' name, bless this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom. Hey, may God bless you richly now as we go to this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom. Warning. Don't let old Satan hold your hand. You'll be lost in sin forever. You'll never reach the promised land. The old crossroads now is waiting. Which one are you? going to take one leads down to destruction the other to the birth of
Nehemiah chapter 6. I remember thinking, Lord, you're going to help me be like old Caleb. I'm going to be seeing real good even when I'm 80. I'm 2040 in one eye and 2030 in another eye. So that ain't 2020 anymore, is it? But years ago, we said last week, God sent a message here one time many years ago. And that's totally different this time, though. But we're going to use the same thought, if you don't mind. Busy being blessed with an exclamation point. You might say, well, preacher, I've got too many burdens. I can't be blessed. Yeah, you're blessed in the midst of your burdens. Just like that little song we just sung, there's a lot of times another battle's coming. And even though God's got you through the last one, you sort of wonder, will God get me through the next one? But the same God that got us through the last battle is obligated to his word, so he'll see us through the next one. And whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Some fabulous, outstanding scriptures in the first chapter of Philippians. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Can you imagine such a thing? Over in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So despite the circumstances that change, the Savior remains the same. So Nehemiah chapter 6, not wanting to yo-yo you, but would you rise to your feet if you're able And let's reverence the reading of the word of the Lord this morning. Chapter 6, Nehemiah, verse 2, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together. Now, I've got that underlined. You can get that up there. And we're going to say that together. Just a moment. There you go. See where I've got that underlined there, let us meet together. Would you say that out loud? Read that out loud. Let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought, now watch this, say this out loud, read it out loud. They thought to do me mischief. One more time, do me mischief. Let me tell you right now, the devil and all the enemies of God and therefore your enemies, all they want to do is to do you mischief. Now, what was Nehemiah's response? It's classic. I sent messengers unto them. Messengers, say messengers out loud. Messengers. You know, that's the same word as angels. So God will fight your battles for you just as he did for Jehoshaphat. He's told Jehoshaphat, this battle is not yours but mine. We used to sing an old song years ago, the battle's his, the victory's mine. So you don't have to cease what you're doing to mess with those who would seek to do you mischief. He sent messengers unto them saying, I am, I am, I am, not just a hearer of the word, the book of James, but a doer. I am doing a great work so that I cannot. You see that I am. So therefore, I cannot come down. Now watch this remarkable question. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? My God, speak to the deep of our hearts and minds and therefore our very lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's sit together in heavenly places and look into the word of Almighty God. This graphic coming up on the screen right now, I am, and then we got a blank, I think. Now what? look at this, I want you to see this. You fill in the blank this morning. I said, you fill in the blank. Mike Sage, may I fill in the blank. I am. Now, Nehemiah, you can study him, get your Bible history uh, concordances or whatever you want to get out. And Nehemiah, of many things, and we're not going to take but just a minute just to cover, just, a, just scratch the surface here. Number one is amazing to me. He had a tremendous high-paying position and job. And therefore, not only did he have money, 
But he had position. He had a great reputation. And he had the ultimate aphrodisiac for the human mind. He had power. Everybody knew who he was. He was the VIP in the, in the administration of Artaxerxes. And there were a few of those. I understand history. You can still study Persian history. We're not here to talk about Persian history. We're talking about the word of God and God's man. And he was very powerful and super rich. Friends, David, he'd snap his finger and get to go anywhere he wanted to go. But in addition, he had a knowledge of and a love for God. Even though his homeland had been devastated by the Babylonians, the house of his God had been ransacked and burned in Jerusalem. The city itself had been left in utter irreparable ruin. And yet here he is, 70 years after the destruction of that city of David, he's still having a knowledge of and a love for the God of David. History does repeat itself. Even in the United States, the last 240 years, there have been periods of growing atheism. I've told you this many times through the decades. Nothing new under heaven, Ecclesiastes 1. It's been a four time. And then things happen that almost force the attention of the human creature back upon the holy creator. God is changeless, infinite, and eternal. And so don't be terrified or agitated or much less even aggravated when you hear people say, we don't want God anymore, we don't need God anymore. As a matter of fact, we're gonna just forget about God. Psalms 9, 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. So we're begging us, God's begging us this morning to ask ourselves a question. Are we forgetting about God or are we remaining faithful to God as in an American nation? A lot of our college kids, my goodness, they're good. They're raised in church and yet then they go off and, they, and, they're ex, and, and really they're exploited because at that impressionable age of 18 years old, you remember when you went to college, first thing you wanted to do after you got over the shock of the cost of your textbooks. <laughs> you wanted to get some decal for your window in your little car because you were naturally very proud of your school. And one of the most influential demographics in America remains the college professor. And now so many of them are so left-wing radical. With an ingrained disdain for Western civilization and the two pillars of Western civilization, which are capitalism and Christianity. And so we all know to take down a structure, you've got to take down the foundation. So then the attacks and the insults against Christianity and the insults and the attacks against capitalism. And so now you go off to college and even though you've got a good base of, of faith, you're taught to ignore moral absolutes. Don't call me a sinner. So then the very essence of Christianity flies in the face of progressivism and multiculturalism and so-called diversity, which is only acceptable as long as your idea of diversity fits their idea of diversity. It's not all inclusive, it's extremely exclusive. You ever thought about that? Because the devil is a liar. He can't tell the truth. So little by little then, by one stepping stone being taken away, another stepping stone is taken away. So don't call me a sinner, don't judge me. So then when you talk about the cross and the Savior, that's all, you've already been set up to be insulted. 
Because we learn early on, don't call me a sinner. So therefore, if I get that ingrained in my mind, and anybody that calls me a sinner is some type of phobe, or hate-filled, or narrow-minded, or whatever it is, then when I come a little farther and say, you need a Savior, the Savior. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me I need a Savior? Yay, you're telling me I'm a sinner. And I'll give you to understand I don't need a Savior because there's nothing wrong with me. And the ultimate pride of the human creature is to deny the holy creator and to do just like the devil taught even Adam to do and that's to doubt and then deny the very word of almighty God. You tell me to wait and save myself to my marriage partner once I've got a little contract of marriage? <laughs> I'll give my body to whoever I want to. And so now we've got a drunken bunch of kids that's already did everything in the world and you lay down with some old mangy dog, you have to get fleas on you. And now later in life you do meet somebody that would make a wonderful soulmate and a life partner. But not only are you very experienced, you laid down and got something now. You can't get out, you can't get off of you. That's the devil. And he desires nothing but to create mischief. If there's any law enforcement officers here or watching on television, I don't have to tell you that nearly every meth lab and every precious person that's eat up with this methamphetamine and everything else, what did they start with? There's still a little plastic bag of it in their meth lab. Nothing more than marijuana. We got to legalize it. Now look what's happening in Colorado. What kind of a nation are we creating? And when all of those folks are applauded and said, oh, how great all of these ideas are, how progressive we are, how we're leaving the old ways. And watch that old Mike Sage on television. He's got enough ignorance to think that all of that sin and we're a bunch of sinners. Well, yeah, don't worry about him. He'll be out of business here in just a few years. If he lives long enough by 2030, there won't even be a church much left. Oh, my soul, you're believing the lie of your daddy the devil do I ever have news for you according to Psalms 102 the children that shall be born will be praising the Lord and after your body's done died and your soul has given an account to the God that you don't even want to believe in I don't know where you'll be your destination's up to you but I know where the church of the Lord Jesus will be if we're not home in heaven celebrating victory forever and ever it'll still the church will still be alive and well on planet earth he said in Matthew 16, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I am now. Our personal histories, our influences, the things that have happened to us, the events in our past, everything worked together to make us who we are. Nehemiah was not only just powerful and wealthy, but they, it's all of history indicates that he was extremely kind, tender-hearted, just basically an admirable person. I am. But you fill in the blank. What did you listen to last night? What did I listen to? What did we allow individually to go through our ears and through our eyes to impact our minds and therefore severely manipulate our lives? Deuteronomy 30 God said, I set before you life and death, good and evil. You choose. You got a free will in you. You woke up this morning, maybe some of you didn't feel too awfully good physically, but you came on anyhow. Your choice. And you're gonna hear, I believe, what God has for all of us for this week. You could have chosen something else. That's why Romans is so, so clear and evident. 
over there in the 14th chapter, we'll all give an account of ourself to God. When I stand at the judgment, I'm not going to be able to say to God, I'd have done better if Cooper Jones hadn't have been such a hypocrite. <laughs> I'd have done better if Ralph Montero hadn't been the kind of guy he was. Lord, I might have been. I, 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 I might have quit. I, I might not have quit church if old Henry Thomas hadn't let me down so bad. I just didn't like him, Lord. <laughs> You're going to see the flaming eyes and the brazen feet of God Almighty. And I know you know that he became a man and died on the cross so you could be a child of God. And it may not dawn on me now, but I promise you I'll know it then that in the midst of every excuse the devil told me to quit, he should have been the reason that I didn't. Hebrews 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I am who I allow God to create me to be every single day. Or I am who I let me build me to be. You can change. You can break that rusty cage and run if you want to. I know we're influenced by the bad things that may have happened to us in life. I know that some of you sitting here, you've got a total and complete different personal history than I do. But Philippians 3 says that we can forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. So if I am naturally minded, carnally minded, worldly manipulated, therefore I can meet with Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem on the plains of Ono. Not only I can I, but I will. And all the devil and the flesh and the world has to do is just wiggle their little finger and my attention is off God, off his word, off his will, off his witness, and my attention gets diverted to whatever it is the devil's saying, look at this. And the natural mind or the carnal mind, both those, the Christian with the carnal mind, the sinner with the natural mind, will inevitably desire and have a strong, insatiable appetite for the things of the world. Sanballat represented basically the devil. Geshem, the Arabian, and Tobiah, Tobiah represented this old flesh that is so manipulated by religion. And then Geshem the Arabian represented the world. So you've got the devil who's the god of this world and then you've got the natural and the carnal mind represented, that's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. First John chapter two, verse 15 and 16, right there represented in Tobiah, Geshem and Sanballat. Let me tell you something, the world wants to take you away from God. The devil wants to destroy your soul in hell. And the flesh is just teetering. With the carnal mind, the Christian will follow the world. With the spiritual mind, will follow the word. And so Nehemiah, I am a servant of the Most High God. I represent God the Almighty. So let me tell you something, fellas. I'm not going to get down off of this wall and parlay with you down on the plains of Ono. The plains of Ono are a no-no for the child of Almighty God. Because if you look to the world, then your old human spirit will get strengthened and the Holy Spirit will be strained, grieved, and quenched. That simple, pure Bible preaching this morning. And if you come down off of your position of purpose, Purpose, then you're going to get down on the plains of oh no and the world and the flesh and the devil will create in you this mindset and that will then therefore create who you are and who you are will determine what you do and as a carnal Christian we're heading to oh no I mean old Sandalit ain't got a problem with a carnal Christian you'll get down off of the wall get down off of those scaffolding bucks and scurry right on down to oh no but listen to Nehemiah I am busy being blessed I've got a 
purpose up here and I've got a power from God to accomplish that purpose. I'm not going to pay you no man. I am being blessed so therefore I cannot. The Holy Spirit is not going to come down these steps and meet you on the plains of Ono. Goodbye Sandal at Tobiah and Geshem. Have a good little party down at Ono. I'm too busy to mess with the likes of you. I'm busy being blessed. That's what God wants you to say this morning. I ain't got time to hear you talk about how bad somebody else is. I ain't got time to talk about some person that's let you down. Sure they've let you down. Other people have been let down. We've all got burdens. We've all got battles to fight. A little appreciation of each other would indeed be in order. But God's people came together as one under the tutelage and leadership of Nehemiah and listened to what he said. I am doing a great work. Why should that work cease while I leave it and come down to you? You that are working the work that God's called you into, the devil will try his best to get you out of that work. Don't you leave that work. Some of you all are in very vulnerable situations. You are working in close proximity of those who are just like you used to be. But you must never allow yourself to slide back to oh no. You stay on the wall and say to those who are in oh no, God has a place for you too. Up here on the wall. Come join us. Because I ain't got time to come join you. Isn't that amazing? So, let's not be forgetting about God. Let's be faithful to God. Now let's run through these real quickly. Look at them in your Bibles now. Back to chapter two of Nehemiah, please. Number one, his decision in the face of desperation. His decision in the face of desperation. I've seen a few of you uh, through the, last several months, take your little camera phone and once they get these graphics up, you kind of snap a picture of them and therefore right on your phone, you've got the message for today and you can take it with you. Isn't that amazing? That's not a bad idea. <laughs> so his decision, well, in uh, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, the book of Joel, in the face of desperation. Now, verse five, chapter two, look at it. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servants found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. Isn't that amazing? Jeremiah 6, 16, asked for the old past wherein is the good way, and walk therein. To you college-age kids this morning, make your decision in the face of desperation that you're gonna believe God. I've showed you this little outline many times through the years, but let's look at it again. Chapter one, verse two. When Hanani, one of my brethren, came and, uh, and he said, and certain men of Judah. Now watch this in verse two of chapter one of Nehemiah. I ask them concerning the Jews back in Jerusalem. So write this down or take a little picture of it. He inquired, he cared enough to ask. You can pretty much tell somebody doesn't care a whole lot if they never ask how you doing. <laughs> Some people don't care how you're doing. <laughs> but Nehemiah had these folks from back in Jerusalem came, showed up and visited him in the palace and he just happened to ask them, how are things? And verse four, he fasted and prayed. See that? So not only did he inquire, but then he interceded. He prayed. Fasting is something according to Jesus, and we certainly won't go into a lesson or study on fasting, but all Jesus meant when he's talking about fasting, and even some demon spirits only come by fasting and prayer. Fasting is the annihilation of the flesh. It's where you decide to take charge over your natural appetites. It's not just deprivation of food. It means that because you get hungry. 
and you won't eat. And you say, listen to me, Mr. Flesh, old human spirit. You're not going to get that peanut butter nanner sandwich before bed tonight. I'm going to give that up. And bottom line, it has to do with training yourself. And a denial and a deprivation of the flesh. Whatever it is. I remember personally, one, and see, you're not supposed to tell anybody either. Pharisees grimace their face, oh, I haven't eaten in two hours. I'm fasting. Jesus said, just shut up about it. That's between me and you. You're not even going to get your reward if you want to talk about it. And you don't need me to teach you in this pulpit. You ought to be reading your Bible and the Spirit of God teaching you at home. You ever notice how some folks claim to know the Bible so good and yet they never obey it? Because they got a selective study habit? I can't just pick out one or two verses. I got to go by all of them. Whatever is pleasurable or desirous of the flesh and to the flesh, every now and then you just got to show the flesh and the old human spirit that the Holy Spirit is boss. And Jesus laid down the totality of himself for us, so we lay down uh, our, the totality of ourselves to him. So what is it then that it, it's a form of worship? Lord, you, you didn't get to drink anything that day at, on the cross. They, you said you were thirsty. They gave you rotten wine. They gave you vinegar. You wanted mercy, you got none. And so it's fellowshipping then with Jesus in a very intimate depth. And it's between you and him, not between you and anybody else. You don't have to tell anybody. You younger married couples, you may not have sexual relations for a week. I know some of you 25-year-olds, they say, oh, Lord, what did he say? Yeah. That's between you and God. You say, we're not going to do that for a period of time, whether it's food, whether it's recreation. Hey, you've been looking forward to seeing that Super Bowl for months. And right before kickoff time, you done watch the pregame, but the Holy Spirit nudges your heart with his elbow and says, you got to turn that off. Come spend time with me. Boy, if you ever hear it's a quiet at freedom. You want to be a Christian? Don't tell me how many great things you do out in public. I'll see the power of God on your fruit and on your performance if you've been in a lot of privacy and intimacy with God and you don't impress God as much with what you do and what you have than you do with what you're willing to give back to him. Well, I'll give him a little time. I'll give him a little effort. What about the very best? What about what really means something to you? Well, getting awful quiet in here, ain't it? You remember I told you Nehemiah was rich and that he was powerful? And yet, when he inquired and when he interceded, he fasted, he gave up himself. And he started praying. And then look at verse six. My goodness, he identified or he intervened in your notes there. But he said, both I and my father's house have sinned. It ain't gonna do me any good if I tell you all the time, oh, we need, we need, we need. Yes, he said we've sinned. But look at the last portion of the verse there. Both I and my father's house have sinned. It ain't gonna be, do me no good to confess Randall's faults. That ain't none of my business. It ain't none of my business to look at any of you and start magnifying your faults. How's that gonna help me? That's gonna be contrawise. It's going to, the devil's gonna slip a little pride in on me and say, well, I'm better than they are. I'm not called to examine you. I'm called, as 1 Corinthians 11 says, to examine myself. Both I and my father's house have sinned. And then he intervened in our verse here in verse five. I'm gonna go build those walls. He got involved. 
So number one, his decision in the face of desperation. Something had to be done. And if we're not in a state of desperation in our country and in our counties and in our region, then what are we? This very morning, people have shared prayer requests for their grandkids and children. Lives are in a desperate state. Our adversary, the devil, 1 Peter chapter 5, is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I know it's frustrating because they won't listen. I know it's aggravating because they won't change. And Jesus said in John 3, this is the condemnation that lights come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They love what they're doing. Their flesh. And there's pleasure in sin for a season. The devil offers all of these things. And just as Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem desired Nehemiah to come to the plains of Ono, what did we read? Because... They wanted to do him mischief. The liar is also a thief. He'll bust you down and you'll get a record and you can't even get a job in a local manufacturing plant because you got a drug charge. The devil's real. And he's a murderer. He'll kill your future. Jesus said, don't fear him that can destroy your body. Rather fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So deceptive, so deceiving. And he's destructive. And the same old devil that has done so much. But Nehemiah made a decision and I hope we will too. His decision in the face of desperation, but then secondly, quickly, his determination despite the force of defiance. Yeah, old Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. Look in your Bibles, chapter two, verse 19. They laughed us to scorn. Absolutely, the devil and the enemies of God, they despise us. (laughs) Don't think the world's gonna appreciate the church. Chapter four, verse one. They not only despised them, but they demeaned them. They mocked the Jews. Said, well, if they build an old wall up there, a little fox will go up and rush against it with his tail. Knock it over. But then chapter four, verse eight, this is a powerful one. They conspired all of them to fight against Jerusalem. They began to demonize them say all manner of evil and stuff about them. Let me tell you something. If you're watching on TV tonight and your precious mom and dad's been trying to help you, but you love your friends and you love your drugs and all that life more than them, what's the matter with you? So the world and somebody out there laughs and mocks and demeans and demonizes your mom and daddy or your church or your preacher, you better be careful. The old preacher man's telling you right now you're walking on thin ice. So he had a determination despite the force of defiance. He's kept on working for God, kept on doing it. And then thirdly and finally, look at this one, chapter 12, verse 27. His dedication amidst the flood of difficulties. (laughs) Why is one difficulty after the other? Man born a woman, few days full of trouble. Yeah, the magnitude of the task, goodness alive, verse 13, 17, and 18 of chapter two, the walls were burned, the gates were all destroyed, everything else, the task was gargantuan. But then chapter three, I want you to glance at chapter three, the miracle of their togetherness. Oh, they finally got together from up in north part of the city, the fish gate, the sheep gate, all of these different, gates, the horse gate, the water gate, the fountain gate over there on the east, the dung gate, the valley gate down there on the south, the corner gate up there on the, on the, what would be the northwest corner, all of those gates. Now listen to me, look in chapter, chapter three, all the way through here. 
next to him, next to him, next to him. And then you can underline that if you don't mind. And then the word repaired over and over and over and over and over again. Let me ask you something. If you had a a mile long wall and you were the only one working on it, you would have 5,280 feet of wall to work on. That'd be tough, wouldn't it, David? But if you had 5,220 workers and helpers, your mile-long task because of togetherness has been reduced to one foot. Out in Revival one night, we talked about all the different families, people, priests, different ones. They all came together and they had a certain amount of footage. One gate, not multiple ones. And they all had a mind to work. And the people said, let us rise up and build. R.A. Torrey told a young preacher one time riding on a train when he sat down beside the great preacher and started telling him all these grandiose things he was going to do. And the old man of God, R.A. Torrey, looked at him with those steely eyes and said, let me tell you something, son. God don't want you to be a flimsy old broom with all kinds of little straws stuck out this way and the other to where you can't even sweep up a floor. But he wants you to be an iron sword with one point. And you do what he's called you to do with all of your heart under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Every person in here this morning, you've got a call and you've got a position. I can't do it. We're teaching on the giftings of the Spirit. I don't have all of them. Some of you here this morning have giftings and enablements to do something in the kingdom of God that I don't have. God not only wants you, but he needs you. Some of you have been saying, well, I don't know what it is. Find it. You say, how? Seek. Matthew 7, and you'll find In the very last verse of Nehemiah, he said, Lord, remember me for good. Matthew 5, Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat, drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Isaiah 48, 11, he said, I'll share my glory with No man. Psalms chapter 90, we live our life as a tale that's told. We're born like we preached at a funeral here about a year ago. We're born as a human being to tell that tale. We live as a human being telling it. And we pass from this life to eternity having told it. Nobody's going to preach my funeral someday. Oh, somebody will if the Lord doesn't come. But I preach it every day that I live. As a tree falls, so shall it lie. Jesus said, you'll know a tree by the fruit it bears. And so as we close, look back at your outline, the magnitude of the task, the miracle of their togetherness, but then the maintenance of his temperance. Oh, Nehemiah had some separation, chapter 9, verse 2, and he had a stand in chapter 12, verse 27. They had their song, their separation, their stand, and their song. (laughs) The joy of the Lord's our strength. Bless old Nehemiah's heart when he went back over to the palace, things fell apart and the people of God went to upsetting one another and burdening one another and then he had to come all the way back over there again but that self-control the words temperance it's the fruit of the spirit what did Proverbs say, we talked to these kids here in junior camp a couple years ago about if you control your own spirit you're stronger than an army And every one of you, and me included, we need to rise up and say, 
God help me stir up and not neglect that spiritual fruit of self-control and take charge of who I am by allowing him to be the chief commander of who I am. Nehemiah didn't get frustrated and aggravated. He just told him the truth. And God used him. And serving God and telling the tale of his life for the glory of God was more important to him than his paycheck, his position, and his earthly power. But you never forget this. The more you give to him, the more he will give to you. And if you will simply open up the palms of your hands and let go, he will fling open the windows of heaven as he did in Malachi's day and fill your human heart with his heavenly treasures. And the amount of heavenly treasures that you are allowed to have access to in your heart is hinging upon and dependent upon how many of your earthly treasures you are willing to flush out of your heart. And if we'll start flushing out these earthly treasures, (laughs) he'll start filling up our heart with his heavenly treasures then you can say like old Nehemiah with a grin like a possum in a briar patch (laughs) I'm busy being blessed and I ain't going to come down and camp on the plains of Ono because I'm being used of God to create something on the walls of God's city. What a calling, what a purpose. Heavenly Father, we can all make choices and make good ones if we want to. Lord, O Nehemiah said, remember me for good. And I pray, O God, that we will let our light shine like you taught us there, Jesus, in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, so that people could see the good works and glorify you. That's the whole thing. It's like we said there in 1 Corinthians 10, 41 whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we do everything for and to your glory. So bless your people, the preachers, the deacons, elders, leadership, membership of all of our local churches throughout the area. God, we're just one church. Yes, many local churches, but one church. And I pray, oh God, as a called out assembly of believers those that have been born again and redeemed. I pray, O God, that we would learn from Nehemiah and the miracle of their togetherness. Just diminish the individual burden on everybody and just enhanced and expanded the individual blessing and the collective blessing. And what was our gargantuan task was accomplished in those short 52 days. And so God... You're the same God now as you were then. And yes, there's some very crucial situations going on in our country and in throughout our communities. But God, you're greater than any obstacle or opposition. So I pray you'll stir us in the faith that we too, just like old Nehemiah, could get busy being blessed. And the blessing is not so much in everything that we can get but in everything that we can give. For it is more blessed to give than to receive. For in reality, it's when we're takers, then we don't have much room at all. And we get all stagnated. It's like a hoarder. God, our heart just gets burdened and encumbered. But Lord, when we give, we're making plenty of room for fresh blessings to take its place. And then not like an old stagnant dead pond, but like the running waters. Thank God, the running brook. Oh, Lord, we flow, you just, we allow it to flow out, then it flows in, and we can be busy being blessed, irregardless of the situation, because we're one with you and with one another. 
and the intelligence, the engineering, all that was needed. <laughs> Lord, you laid the you you hung the plumb line on planet Earth, and you hang it on nothing, and you created the universe. So you are our senior partner who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. You're just looking for some trust, faith, obedience, and love, and compassion. So God, we're going to give you all of us because you've already given us all of yourself. Bless every viewer now, especially those that are lost. I pray, oh God, for conviction and therefore the end result consequentially salvation to the lost and then Lord to the sick and to the struggling and to the stressed out and to the down and discouraged and despondent and defeated Lord that they would feel your hand beneath them lifting them up and that we would never as a Christian be guilty of self-centeredness or, or pride or anything like that to where you would take your hand from beneath us, to where we would just be tumbling, uh, helder-skelder, headlong, no purpose, no vision. My God, bless your church in these moments to be a blessing to you, to each other, and a resource of light to this dark world. Love in the midst of hatred, warmth in the midst of coldness, giving in the midst of so much taking, sacrifice in the face of so much self-centeredness. Thank you, God. You move, you minister. I don't have to tell you what to do. You know, you know what to do. I pray, oh God, we'll all get out of your way and let you have your way. And we'll see some things being done if we could realize that we can get busy being blessed. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Always good to have you with us. Hope you'll take the message, tuck it down in your heart, and that you'll be busy being blessed and be a blessing to someone else this week. Mark down on your calendar now, September the 10th, next opportunity we have to all of us get together here on Freedom Ridge. Well, man, I'm telling you right now, we'll cut the honey tree down and have us a good time, and you all come and be with us on that Sunday morning, September the 10th, for our homecoming here at Freedom. Thank you for your continued prayers. Without the power of God and the prayers of God's people, we could do nothing. And we're still waiting on God. Uh, materials to arrive, finishing all of our classrooms, getting them up and running, everything done here for the fall of the year. Because mentioning homecoming, after homecoming, we got to be ready. And we got to be out here in the harvest. Pray for us here at Freedom. We'll be praying for you. As always, thanks for watching. And until next week, May God bless you richly, then may he use you for his glory and to truly be a blessing to someone else.